money shifts resources around. Money is power, therefore, in our society. And if you don't understand money, you will not be able to understand which kind of groups have what kind of power. We have the climate crisis. We have a lot of inequality. And of course, the question is what kind of economic policies are possible. You need to understand how money works, how money is created, because otherwise people will tell you things that are not correct. Initially, we are all fed this common wisdom that the government must wait for enough tax revenues before it can act on certain social programs, before it can invest. And of course, it all begins with government investment. In fact, it's not going to happen unless the government spends the money first. That's why people can pay taxes, because the government is spending first. <laughs> This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley and I'm Patricia Pino. And we are delighted to be joined once again today by our friend, economist, author, and one of the organizers of the upcoming European MMT conference, Dr. Dirk Enns. Thanks for making the time to join us today, Dirk. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kristen and Patricia. Uh, we're really excited to talk to you about the conference, but let's assume there's a first-time listener out there who thinks economics and economics conferences aren't for them. And maybe they've been scared off by some of the jargon. What would you say to that person? What's different about MMT? Why do we think it's so urgent? Well, I think that it's very urgent to understand how money really works because we have all these problems in our societies. We have the climate crisis, climate emergency. We have a lot of inequality, especially now with the pandemic. There's lots of mostly workers who have lost purchasing power. And of course, the question is what kind of economic policies are possible to create a better future for basically everybody. And of course, to understand how we could move the economy in a different kind of direction. So, so what we have a more just distribution of income and wealth, perhaps, or that we have more green investment. You need to understand how money works, how money is created, because otherwise people will tell you things that are not correct. They will tell you that the government doesn't have the money, for example, whereas it really is the creator, the monopoly supplier of money. So MMT is really an empirical theory of money creation that explains how money is created. And that's already enough once you understand that to understand roughly what is possible and what is not possible inside your economy. And because all the MMT people are very nice people, it's a very good idea to come to our Berlin conference in September and listen to some of them. So we, of course, allow questions from beginners and we always answer them in a nice way. I mean, we all started small and we all started not understanding money. So, I mean, it's a learning process, really. And yeah, I mean, normally lay people don't go to these kind of academic conferences, but we're trying to, I don't know, soften the board a little bit and hope for a participation of people who are just interested in money and how it works. Patricia, I was going to turn to you because you're somebody that's gone on this journey and we've gone on it together. Dirk just said just then, we all started off not understanding money and we've all had to go on a journey. And it's funny though, isn't it? Because people will say I'm no economist, but then they will just say stuff that seems to be like received wisdom about money, what it is, what it does. But it's regarded as common sense, right? And yeah. And they get really angry when you say, well, actually, there's some sort of counterintuitive things that happen to be true about money. And we know this <laughs> and it's very hard to break through. How does it change things when we understand the system? Why is it important to get the money story straight? 
I think it's because it really drives your understanding of power relationships in the economy. And I know that sounds really abstract, but initially we are all fed this, as you say, kind of common wisdom. The government is privy to the private sector's activity for funding and therefore that the government must wait for enough tax revenues before it can act on certain social programs or before it can invest at any substantial level. And of course, if those taxes are not there because of economic downturn or maybe other reasons, then the government cannot do anything. And I feel that's what's been happening since 2008. It's always not, we have this enormous list of things we want to achieve, but we have to wait until better times, right? But the MMT money story actually shifts things around and says, no, it all begins with government investment. And it all means that we don't have to wait for taxation to happen. In fact, it's not going to happen unless the government spends the money first. That's the source of the money. That's why people can pay taxes because the government is spending. So the MMT perspective is much more I mean, it makes a lot more sense to me. It, I think anybody who hears it just cannot unhear it, cannot go back to the old perceived wisdom because suddenly a lot more things make sense. But it also things like the dynamics of power between government and private sector and that relationship also take better shape. I absolutely agree. I mean, money shifts resources around. I mean, money is power, therefore, in our society. And if you don't understand money, you will not be able to understand which kind of groups have what kind of power. So yes, I mean, it's on a fundamental level, it's extremely important to understand money because it drives the whole political process. I mean, the government could create something for us for the public purpose and maybe also provide it for free, whereas the private sector will have to borrow money in order to invest mostly if they don't have the savings to do it, and normally they don't. So these are two competing mechanisms to organize society. One is profit maximizing and one is public purpose oriented. So, I mean, there is an alternative here and there's many politicians who don't want us to see these kind of alternatives, but we have seen in the pandemic also that there is this alternative that the government creates massive amounts of money and spends them. And we have seen in the UK and elsewhere that also this can be a huge mistake. So I think that in the UK, for example, the government spent a lot of money on some kind of app that was supposed to be helping the government to find out who got COVID and how they got it. And it didn't work at all. So yes, I mean, that can be a problem. But the money was not the problem. The money is there. And because you have both had to do battle with this because you're both academics. For people who maybe have researched or even had an education that took in some mainstream economics, how might you appeal to them to consider MMT insights? For instance, can we point to where the mainstream got it wrong or where MMT got it right? I've been there. I mean, I was a mainstream economist. So when I heard about MMT, I thought, okay, that's interesting. So if MMT is correct, then most of the things that I learned about macroeconomics are wrong. But MMT is an empirical theory, and that means it's falsifiable. So they make empirical statements about the world. And of course, you can try to find out whether in the real world it things work like this or maybe not. So one thing, for example, that I found in the textbooks before I learned about MMT is the so-called money multiplier story. So in the textbook, it says the central bank creates money, it lends it out to the banks, and then the banks lend out that money to us and to the firms, households and firms. So I asked myself, well, do I have an account with the German central bank? Well, I don't. So that means I cannot borrow that kind of money that the central bank has created. I also will not get a cash loan, so that would be an alternative route. So MMT has said that the banks create bank deposits, which are promises of payment, and that's basically what they are doing. So empirical reality easily tells you that this is correct and then the mainstream approach is wrong. Another thing that opened my eyes was that MMT says that when the government spends more money, there will be more reserves, so more central bank deposits held by the banking system. They will not know what to do with it. I mean, maybe because of the increase in government spending, there's a little bit more demand for cash, but that will be less than the amount of money supply going up. So talking about reserves. So the banks will try to lend out that money because they want to have an interest rate, earning an interest rate on that money. And when all the banks try to lend out more of their central bank deposits and there's no demand for it, well, then on the interbank market, the interbank market interest rate will drop. And in the extreme, it will drop to zero. So the ISLM model, which is supposedly a Keynesian model in the textbooks, 
says that when you shift government spending upwards, you shift the IS curve outwards. This is for only for those who know about the model. But because the LM line goes up, so it has a positive slope, it means that when government spends more, the interest rate goes up and there will be crowding out. And that's also an empirical thing. So whether government spending causes the interbank market interest rate to go up or down, well, theoretically, you can have both. But the question, of course, that matters most is what happens in reality. And at University of Göttingen, where I studied, I, I had a colleague and he went on to work with Deutsche Bundesbank, the German central bank. So I asked him, what happens if the government spends more? And he said, well, there's more reserves. The interest rate will drop to zero, but the government by the rules of the eurozone is required to issue bonds to the exact tune of the net injection of government spending so that it balances out so that the interest rate can be maintained at the formal level. So I said, okay, yeah, well, that's it. And so if this is how it works in reality, then we have to adjust our models. And I think for everybody who has a mainstream education, try to look at m and from an empirical perspective and try to isolate those kind of issues where you think that you can find some kind of answer, empirical answer, and then you can see who's right and who's wrong. And I think that m and has been consistently right. Many central bankers have confirmed this. They just don't want to talk about it too openly. But there's also then this Bank of England paper in 2014 about endogenous money. So they confirm what MMT says, what post Keynesian said, what Vixalian said already. So I think that's the way to go forward. Just try to use MMT to learn about how the economy works. Don't see it as something which you have to fight and which is somehow a ideology. No, it. And that's the main advantage of MMT. You can try to find out whether it's correct or not. That's what I mean when I say it's an empirical theory. Whereas the mainstream just says that money supply equals money demand. They have a couple of assumptions and there's no way for you to find out whether there is really a speculative demand for liquidity. Or, that's very abstract. So MMT is much, much better in that sense. Let me just jump in here, just in case any of those new people listening heard a lot of words there that were like, oh, I don't know about that and I don't know about that. If you go to the show notes of this episode, there'll be links. I'll try and throw in as many links to what Dirk just said, uh, trying to get you to understand things like the ISLM curve and the loanable funds theory, I guess there's another way to say that. And the other thing is, Dirk just said banks will lend out reserves. And what we mean is they're not going to lend them out to their retail customers. There's an interbank market, as Dirk said, that banks lend central bank money to each other for reasons <laughs> that we won't go into right now because we've done whole episodes about it. And those episodes will get you from scratching your head to understanding it. So look out for those links in the show notes. So when I was at university doing the master's, I found it interesting and made it sort of a point of it to observe students' attitudes towards the material they were learning, right? And th this is a master's degree, so a lot of them had already gone through undergraduate economic, mainstream economics education, but not all of them had. So some of them had, and this is the first time they were facing economics. So there were two distinct groups that I found in terms of how they approached learning economics. And I found that about half of them were solely interested on the employment outcomes of their degree. And I think that's not criticizing anybody. I, I know people need an income. Right. And when you do a degree and you pay for a diploma, particularly, you are looking for the job prospects that is offering you. That is completely normal. And a lot of them were, if they ever came to question the material, they didn't really question it very long because they believe that, well, the point here is that I, I learned this and then I'll get this job question and it, is it really my business? But the other half were, of course, they wanted jobs as well and they wanted a well-paid employment, but they were much more willing to question what they were learning. And uh, I think they had more of a, a kind of, I'm going to learn economics to make the world better kind of attitude rather than simply just to get a job. And I think that latter group is the one that would most easily to question, to make questions like you and I did, Christian, initially, and then to finally stumble upon perhaps MMT or other alternative heterodox theories and to say, well, there is validity to this. And I think everybody at the time when I was doing the master's understood that mainstream economics was going through a bit of a crisis. They just didn't know what the problem was. But only that latter group really cared about finding out what those problems were. 
And I think they will find the answers on their own, honestly, as long as they stumble upon it in some way or they find it on their own initiative. But the other group, perhaps it may take them a bit longer simply because it's not that they're ideologically committed to the status quo. It's just that it's not really in their interest to spend so much energy questioning it. And they're more likely to go along with things as they are, I think. So I think both those groups, the approach to maybe persuade them of changing their views on mainstream economics is different. Some of them may be more perceptive than others. But yeah, it's just something to bear in mind when you meet somebody. It's not necessarily about, oh, they're evil and they're committed to the mainstream. It's just that it takes a lot of effort to unlearn something that you've spent so many years learning. Unfortunately, and I I think this is to do with privatization or the sort of commodification of everything, including education, (laughs) that kind of puts people in a frame of mind of, look, will this be on the test? I'm not bothered about pushing back on whether it's right or wrong. Just I need to get the right answers so I get the piece of paper, so I get the job. Yeah. And one of the things that I maybe resented a little bit about the structure of the course, the particular structure of the course was that perhaps it was so intense. There was so much information and you would think that's a good thing because, oh, we're learning so much. But the issue is that there wasn't really any time to absorb or question the information we were given. There were barely five minutes at the end of class for anybody to ask any questions. And that was it. And so there wasn't enough discussion. It was more like, as you say, you know what, just stop giving me these alternative theories, just let me study for exam. And that's it. So yeah, while we're questioning market mechanisms, (laughs) I just wanted to talk about the here and now for those of us in the UK. Our national water utilities were privatized in 1989. And I would say now it's demonstrably not working out for us, the users of the service. So for instance, Thames Water, after delivering big bonuses and dividends and big salaries for executives, is £16 billion in debt. But commentators are falling over themselves to think of ways to argue for keeping it in private hands. So Dirk, my question in the abstract is, what would have to happen for us to declare the privatization of a human right, water, (laughs) What would have to happen to declare that a failure? Surely the jury is in by now. The water companies have been leaking 3 billion litres of water daily. They've been illegally dumping untreated sewage into rivers. Now they're literally bankrupt. The profit motive clearly doesn't work for this kind of thing. How can we be talking about anything other than bringing it back into public ownership? Yeah, I mean, the question of whether you run a public utility as a public utility or as a private monopoly I mean, it's a centuries-old question, and the answer that we normally get in most societies is that we have public monopolies, because if we have a private monopoly, then there's an incentive for the private company to, well, to reduce investment, to increase prices, and to maximize profits. And after a couple of decades, you get results which look like what you see with Thames Water, so neglect of investment and now things have fallen into disrepair the company has been settled with debt which probably has been paid out to the shareholders and the quality of the service now is very poor with sometimes water being dumped into the rivers so that's a very typical kind of case for a company that should go back into public ownership and i think probably it will except that the public debate is a little bit lacking but Well, facts are sometimes very convincing, and I kind of hope that in the end, the facts will win, because keeping it as a private monopoly, there's really no reason to do it. I mean, if you go back to Margaret Thatcher and examine the reasons why they did all these privatizations, why they said they wanted to increase productivity and efficiency, and they wanted also to increase participation of the British people so that they would own stocks and shares of those public companies, that would then be private companies. But I don't think that the shareholders of Thames Water are normal British people. I think it's probably hedge funds from somewhere or Australian pension funds, these kind of financial institutions. And also productivity has never increased. Now the service is a disaster. So even by its own account, privatization has failed to deliver the gains that were promised. And I think that probably we will need a little bit more of a public debate, but in the end, the inevitable will come because there's just two ways of running this kind of water company because I mean you have these increasing returns to scale which means it has to be a big one because it's a network it doesn't make sense that people have their own private plants at home or they run it by the families that kind of solution is out 
So you can only have a private or public sector solution. And if the private sector solution doesn't work, then it doesn't matter what kind of ideology you follow, but there's only one solution left, which is a public sector option. What is the reason they're saying not to privatize it? Is it simply too much government debt? Yeah, it could be that. But I'm just frustrated because all the nominally progressive media that I'm seeing is saying it's a regulatory failure. That's where they want to just keep saying regulatory failure over and over again. And it seems to me that for privatization to continue, which is the plan, it would seem, (laughs) there must be constantly failing regulators or so-called regulators because anybody with objective oversight would say, look on a point of logic at an organization like this that privatizes gains and socializes losses. By definition, (laughs) they can't act in the public interest. That's the thing. They're trying to regulate a private institution to the extent that it stops behaving as a private institution and behaves like a public institution instead of just making it a public institution. Well, I mean, Fergal Sharkey, I don't know if you know who Fergal Sharkey is, Dirk, but he used to be the lead singer of The Undertones who wrote Teenage Kicks and he became a solo artist and now he's an activist for water or I would say more like a consumer watchdog and that's the problem I would say that like we're seeing this as a consumer issue rather than like humans with human rights like to water so I would say Fergal Sharkey's position is water privatization has been a failure of the public sector because the regulators are letting us down so let's use the public sector to make privatization work any failure of the water company, they will use this to say, well, the reason is that we're not making enough profits and therefore we need to raise prices. Is that their preferred solution? I think the whole media game seems to be just very much not looking at pretty much what Dirk nailed when he spoke about it, which is if you've got to deliver a service, that's going to cost some money. But if you have to deliver that service plus dividends and returns for shareholders and golden handshake deals for people on the way in and golden parachutes for failed executives on the way out on top of what it actually costs, that's going to cost more. But it just seems it's all about not saying that. (laughs) I think it's about creating loads of bluster about how bad these companies have been without going, well, they're designed that way. And in this instance, I mean, in any other industry, one would say the distinction is that, well, one is in inverted commas, funded through taxation, as politicians like to say, and then the other one is just consumer choice, right? They can choose to consume. But in case of water, people don't have a choice. Well, you know, you awful consumers chose this terrible one company that is supplying your house (laughs) with the human right to water. (laughs) You've only got yourselves to blame. But this is where I see MMT coming in, Dirk, because the media and politicians are telling us we can't do anything. We can't afford to nationalize, say, water utilities. We can't afford a Green New Deal because government debt is too high. The government's taking on so much debt. Look at this huge number. They're not going to be able to pay the interest on the debt, let alone the principal. How can we calm people down who are worrying about government debt? Well, I think the first thing we would have to do is to just define public debt. So public debt is the difference between what the government has spent so far into the economy to hopefully make life better for most people, minus the tax revenues over all the centuries, in the case of the United Kingdom at least. So the money that the government has spent and not yet collected as tax revenues, that's the outstanding public debt in pound sterling terms. And of course, you can divide it by GDP if you want, but it doesn't really do anything. I mean, it's just a statistic. So once you define the public debt like this, you will see that the government doesn't owe anything to the people, except maybe that they will take their money back when taxes are paid. So if you want to reduce public debt, it's not the government which has to make payments, but it's the people who have to make payments. So if you want to bring government debt or public debt down to zero, you would have to have tax payments worth the amount of public debt. That would be the only way, technically, to reduce government debt to zero. And once you understand this, you see that private debt and public debt are completely different things because if I owe my bank £10,000, then I would have to do those payments. And if there's a public debt of, let's say, I don't know, a thousand billion pounds, let's say, then it's not the government which will have to make those payments. It's the people who will, in the end, in the future, at some point, use those pounds to make payments in terms of taxes. So we should not really think of the public debt as something 
like a private debt. It's not a debt at all. As I said, the only thing that the government owes is to accept its money back for the payment of taxes. And we should instead say, look, we can create money, which is basically a tax credit for us. So we pay our taxes with that. So if we can do some good with the government, let's spend that money. But we have to be careful a little bit because we might not get the resources that we would want to use. And also the resources that we do use, if we are the government, they're not available anymore for the private sector to either consume or to use for investment. Okay, so understanding MMT does not lead to a world where the government can just spend on whatever they want. But instead, the resources are limited by the people. So the British citizens can offer, I don't know, labor services to the government or goods and services, but that's not unlimited. So it's very important, I think, to stress that you should basically use government spending to target the deficits that you have in your society and not to think about the public deficit, which is just the flow of government spending minus tax revenues in one period, or the public debt, which is the stock thing, which is basically the historical government spending minus historical tax revenues. And we made the mistake in the last couple of decades to look too much at government deficits and government debt instead of looking how at the real world and how government spending can influence the real world in a better way. We have already seen in the past that having the public sector run monopolies is an acceptable policy. Of course, it's not perfect. And if there's a problem, it has to be addressed. But we have seen that it works and it works better than what we see now in the United Kingdom. So I think it would definitely be worth trying to do this kind of alternative policy of basically returning the water rights to the public sector and having a public water company. Mm, yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is probably too much of a broad sweeping statement, oh, but I seem to specialize in those. So maybe you guys can temper what I'm saying here. But I'm saying, well, let's give the shareholders of Thames Water and senior managers like a pound to split between them. Because, you know, at the moment between them, they've got minus 16 billion pounds. So that's quite a generous offer. And then we put the current workers on the government's payroll and watch the water bills come down. That's the way I see it. Now, I'm sure somebody will have to weigh in and say, it's really not that simple, but have at it. Well, that would address the concern that government is less efficient at running things if you have the same people running it effectively, just under different priorities. I mean, it's very important that the government has public employees and they are well paid, they're well educated, and they know how to deal with managerial issues that they have what Mariana Mazzucato calls the entrepreneurial state in mind. I think that's something which is not possible to build up inside of a couple of months, perhaps, because it would require a change in the attitude towards government. In most Western European countries, the public sector jobs are not well paid and they attract normally probably below average productivity workers. So probably if you want to increase the profile and the role of the public sector, you would also have to think about changing the way that you attract people to work in the public sector because otherwise there might be a problem because management will still not be okay. So yeah, I mean, this is complicated and it will require some kind of change of public policy, but I'm pretty positive that it will be successful in the end. So turning the corner to talk about the conference, the subtitle of the conference is Navigating the Poly Crisis. And maybe we've just been talking about one offshoot of the poly crisis. But as you see it, what is the poly crisis? What are the problems we need to solve? Okay. Well, first of all, I have to say that I didn't come up with that title. So um, part of the group of organizers, but the organizing committee, they have done a wonderful job. They have created this program. They have created the title. And that's all very nice. Poly crisis, as I understand it, it's a crisis in many different dimensions. We already talked about the climate crisis. We already talked about also the inequality crisis. But I think there's more crisis. We have a crisis with sustainability in many sectors. We will have to adjust to some extent also to the rising temperatures that we will see, even if we try to reduce the amount of global warming as much as possible. It will still be hotter in most parts of Europe, probably. We can see it today again that we have heat waves in Spain, but also rain. So you have both heat and rainfall at the same time. So this creates many crises. And then, of course, there's also the question of how do we treat the what is called the global south. So when it comes to getting rid of this fossil fuel economy, how can we make sure that we don't structure our new kind of relationships with the global south along 
the colonial relations that we still see in a lot of sectors of the economy. So how do we make sure that we don't just exploit as the West, we don't exploit the South just grabbing what we need for our green transition and then we leave people there being once again poor and dispossessed. So this is also one of the aspects I think that we want to talk about. And I think we also will have panels on gender and also on feminist economics. So yeah, I think I cannot go into the details of all these kind of crises, but I'm sure that you more or less know what I'm talking about. I don't know if you saw this in terms of how the climate crisis relates to monetary nuts and bolts, but recently Thomas Ferguson, who developed something called the investment theory of party competition, which just to oversimplify a bit, argues that political parties are vehicles for transmitting the imperatives of clusters of mega donors and their firms who have a common desired outcome. It's well worth a look at that book. They made a film out of it called The Golden Rule, The Investment Theory of Politics. But anyway, Thomas Ferguson co-authored a recent column in the newspaper and the title says it all. And that title is Central Banks Raising Interest Rates Makes It Harder to Fight the Climate Crisis. Dirk, could you say why? The mainstream normally says that when you increase interest rates, that you will have less private investment. And that seems to be the point that he's making here. He says that at 0% interest rates, new investment into renewable energy would be more profitable. I think that's correct, first of all. But the question is whether it stops new investment right now. I mean, probably if you expect to have a strong demand for energy in the next couple of years, probably there should be enough expected profits already so that the cut in the interest rate, in the expected interest rate by, I don't know, roughly 3% or 4% is probably not making a, a big difference. It also depends on whether the government wants to run the green energy projects to cover their costs. So if you say the revenues of these green energy projects have to be at the same level as the government spending that are used plus interest, then of course you would expect that prices would be higher when interest rates are higher because you will have to recoup more of the money that you spend as a government. So I think there's a lot of open questions here about the way that the government behaves. So if the government behaves in a neoclassical mainstream kind of way, then his argument might be correct. But if you understand with MMT that higher interest rates means that there's more aggregate demand and also that the government can just spend more and can set prices at will, they don't have to recoup the money that they spend through tax revenues, for example, offering public services like public transport and cities for free, whatever the costs are, whatever the interest rates are, they can certainly do that. Then, of course, it's not as convincing as it looks at in the first place. I think there's two sides to the coin in that he's saying the other side of it, and I'm sorry if you've already said this, but the idea is that the higher interest rates advantage fossil fuel companies because you've got your insurgent green tech companies, which, as you said, they need investment. You're putting up the cost of credit for that investment. So that's a handicap for the green tech companies when you raise the interest rates. But for the fossil fuel companies, we've seen how firms with price setting power are good at passing on increased costs and even using inflation, for instance, as an excuse to increase profit margins. So that seems to be a problem with high rates as well, that the oil companies can just price that in and even use it to create a bigger margin. Yeah. I mean, the second point in that article is that we also say that if there's less competition, there will be higher profits. So if you assume that high interest rates do create less competition, then of course that point is also okay. But the big question, of course, is whether the green energy supply in the future depends on private sector investments and probably it might be more interest rate sensitive than if it would be public sector investment, but even the private sector investment, normally the government gives a lot of guarantees and they do co-funding or they underwrite some contracts, which gives the companies a guaranteed price to sell, for example. So there has been a lot of de-risking anyway to make private investment, green investment go up. So I doubt that interest rates play such a big role as is implied here in this article. I agree with that as well. So if we only look at it from the private sector perspective like this article is doing I guess and saying that th this is going to have an impact on investment as far as I understand it and correct me if I'm wrong but green technologies don't need to be cheap per se to be invested in they need to be cheaper than the alternative which is oil 
that's one of the key drivers. And then, of course, it goes as well as to the relationship as to cost versus level of demand. If companies are making a lot of profit, then the increased cost may not be such an issue. And once you bring the government sector in, then things become even less certain because the government can do an awful lot that is not dependent on interest rates to achieve. And even things like what Dirk just mentioned about even just providing support to the private sector might completely change the dynamics of that. I didn't quite agree with a part of the article myself, which was, I think they were talking about making fiscal space. And they were saying, this doesn't mean, th- this plan does not necessarily mean prohibitively high rates of taxation, though we think taxes need to rise on higher incomes and offshore tax havens need to be sealed. Rather, John Maynard Keynes's suggestion to control wartime inflation by requiring wealthier citizens to save some of their income by investing in interest-paying bonds is a much more humane way of limiting spending than throwing people out of work. And I agree that's more humane than throwing people out of work. And I also take my hat off to them because there's obviously some kind of MMT-ish insight in there because they're saying that using bonds is not a way to fund the government using bonds is a way to get people with money to defer spending that money and defer their consumption so that's an insight that we'd agree with i think but my problem is why should people get money just for having money these wealthier people the government will be saying yeah just don't spend your money and we'll give you more money but have you noticed though that when interest rates were very low all the articles were about how low interest rates are increasing inequality and it's bad And now that interest rates are much higher, I mean, this seems to be saying to me by making the market less competitive and increasing unemployment that it is driving inequality. And so which one is it? I think you have the solution. Inequality is driving inequality. (laughs) Yeah, possibly. (laughs) That is the only possible outcome that makes sense. (laughs) We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Hey there, dear listener. Our sponsor for this episode of the MMT podcast is you, the listener, and we can't do it without you. And when I say it, I mean our aim to promote the best understanding that we can put together of how this thing called the economy actually works and how we can make it better. And we think a big part of that is knowing that better is possible and that many destructive policy choices are often sold to us by falsely equating the spending capacity of a government to that of a household. The way your government spends is nothing like the way a person or a household spends because currency issuing governments are the source of their own spending money. Unemployment, underemployment, underfunded public health services, poverty, and many other things that politicians and pundits sell to us as sad but necessary are actually never necessary. Our money system has been mischaracterized in the media and academia for decades. An electorate that knows how it works can truly change things for the better and literally save lives. So we hope you can find it in your heart to support us via patreon.com slash MMT podcast because it really helps keep the show going and we want to make it bigger and better. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive back in. That was what I was going to ask though. So this idea of like, okay, so there might be a way that we need to cool off demand. What's a fair way to do that rather than just giving people who already have money more basic income, i.e. using the government bond system to make people who already have money a little bit richer. Also, not to ignore the fact that, yeah, we probably want some kind of tax advantage savings so that people could perhaps save up for old age. I wonder what your thoughts were on that. Well, I think that, I mean, what the government should do is to offer to its citizens very nice things to consume, like public transport, both local transport and also regional transport, so that the people might have less money. How you take it out of circulation is then another question, whether you increase tax rates or whether you want to offer some kind of sp- special bonds, like green bonds, which pay a high interest rate. But in the end, I mean, what you really have to reduce is spending. That's the end. So it doesn't matter whether you can have tax rates going up or you issue more bonds, but in the end, what you will have to achieve is to have less spending so that there's less resources used. That's the goal of these kind of green investment policies. So it would be great, for example, if people would think, oh, well, I now have lots of options when it comes to public transport, 
And it's nice for me to be driven somewhere by public transport, because if I would drive on my own, I would be tired and there was a lot of aggression in traffic and it sucks. I mean, it's much more civilized to be driven around and it's also cheaper. So in the end, you can reduce nominal incomes and people are still okay with that because they think that the money that they have, they can spend it in a way that their life is better than before. I think that's the main thing that you will have to achieve. So I would not try to argue that you have to follow some kind of degrowth strategy where you're telling people what kind of stuff they will not be able to consume. I think that's politically very unpopular. And also, I think it's probably not necessary. It's besides the point. So yes, of course, when we try to reduce energy consumption, resource consumption, we will bring down the amount of stuff that we can buy in our societies. Yes, that's true. But I think that kind of puts a very negative spin on the whole project, right? I mean, it means that everybody will have to tighten their belt and you get into this kind of new classical stuff, this kind of new classical metaphors. So instead, I would use this kind of framing of the Green New Deal and say, look, we will have a different future. It will be different from our day. And there's lots of stuff that we will be consuming tomorrow that we even can't think about today. And you will have, or we will have better lives. We will be probably be working less. You will have sustainable consumption. So you don't have to worry too much when you consume something. And I think that's a very good way to move forward. And yeah, I mean, then probably I would use tax rates more or less to try to reduce the consumption of the rich. But I don't think that this will be the main policy instrument because I mean, the rich are so rich that taking away part of their income will not stop them driving and flying around the planet, wasting a lot of resources for not many results. I mean, they're just keeping up with the Joneses. So they're just trying to be part of this kind of millionaire jet set maybe. But they're, probably they're not really happy with that either. So I think that these kind of instruments to reduce general aggregate demand, I don't think that they will play a large role when it comes to the green transition. I think the main things will be yeah, moving from private solutions to public infrastructure when it comes to solving our economic problems. And also moving from consumption to economic rights. That will also be part of this solution, I guess. But yeah. That's just my opinion. I think we can all defer on this because it's a very complex project. And in terms of getting public investment, maybe partially right, Bidenomics seems to be getting a decent hearing, the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act. And Stephanie Kelton recently contributed to a piece on Bidenomics talking about a concept called crowding in which I wanted to talk about. And you touched on this earlier in the episode, Dirk. We need to start with the crowding out theory. Would you mind just going over in broad strokes again what that is? Yeah. But first, let me point out that I think it's very important that we get these kind of ideas as they are developing right now. We see that economics is moving as a discipline. So they call it Bidenomics. In Germany, they're also talking about having a new economics. Isabella Weber was involved in that at least on Twitter. So there's this kind of ideas floating around that we need to change economics. I think that's very important to see this kind of development. But yeah, the concept normally is called crowding out. So in neoclassical economics, you have savers who are not consuming everything that they produce. So they have some leftover stuff and they lend out that leftover stuff to people who offer an interest rate to them. Okay, so imagine a farmer and he has a couple of bushels of wheat left and he's lending them out to some investor. And of course, the amount of saving or savings, it doesn't really matter in English, I guess, is limited because you can only lend out what you have not consumed and what was part of your production. And because of that, these kind of mainstream or neoclassical economists believe that when the government borrows more money, when they spend more, then of course, there's less resources available for the private sector. And this is completely ingrained in neoclassical economics and in a lot of models also used by policymakers in the United States, for example. And of course, it's not true. So when the government spends more money, the central bank just credits the accounts of some of the banks, and those banks credit then our accounts, households, and maybe also firms, which means that when the government spends more money, we have more money, and then we can spend more money as well. And if companies, private companies, if they're competing to get basically contracts from the government, they also might want to invest in order to be able to cater to the government. So it would be logical if you understand MMT that an increase in government spending will not crowd out private investment, but instead crowd in private investment. And that is what has happened in the United States with the Inflation Reduction Act, 
that everybody has seen that private sector investment is up and not down. And that has also prompted the rethinking in that kind of field that we should change the assumptions that we're using in our economic models if reality shows us that crowding in is a normal thing to happen, whereas crowding out is something which almost never happens. I mean, look at Greece, for example, in the Eurozone, when they cut government spending there by 20% in the 2010s, the economy collapsed. Okay, so if you cut public spending, you reduce private sector incomes, and that means you also reduce private sector spending. Okay, so there's a crowding in effect in both in the positive way and also in the negative way. And that's something which I think in the US now is probably clearer than in Europe because we didn't see the government spending increase as much as Biden did that. But of course, it would be the same for our economies in Europe. For newer people, a mantra you can have in your head at all times is one person's spending is another person's income. One entity's spending is another entity's income. And that's what's happening there with the increasing government spending. And here in the UK, our Green Party, who really mean well and know there's something amiss with the banking system and the way it's viewed, have come up with what I would say is the wrong diagnosis to fix banking. If you read their website, they want to replace the nine unelected people who set interest rates every six weeks over here, the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, with another unelected committee who will decide the quantity of money that the government can issue called the National Monetary Authority. So at the moment, the government controls money issuance, shall we say, by price, not quantity. And their idea is to flip that around. Anybody, what's your reaction to that idea? Well, I mean, we've been there. In the 1980s, in the United States, Paul Volcker introduced these kind of monetarist ideas of giving the central bank money supply targets for different kind of money supply measures and then they try to enforce this and sometimes they increased the amount of money by buying government bonds so that the banks had more reserves sometimes they reduced the amount of reserves by buying more government bonds from the side of the fed and they realized that once they started doing that that the interest rate on the interbank market only knows two directions of course up and down so either the central bank by trying to reduce the amount of money they make banks struggle for money. And that means the interest rate goes up towards like maybe even 10, 20% intraday. Or if they have too much liquidity in the banking system. So if the banks have sold a lot of government bonds to the central bank, and then they don't know what to do with those reserves. And back in the 80s, there was no interest on deposits at the Fed. They tried to lend out those reserves, which they didn't need. And they drove the interest rates to zero. So that's the lesson that the world has learned when monetarism, as it was called, was applied, it just doesn't work. You lose control over the interest rate. So you cannot have both. You cannot target both the quantity of money, the quantity of central bank money, and then set the interest rate. Only one thing is possible. And the banks will normally tell you that they very much prefer to be able to make all their payments so that they have enough liquidity. And they also want to know what kind of interest rate they will have to pay for borrowing money or lending money in the interbank market. So the banks have a clear preference for interest rate targeting and not monetary targeting or monetary supply targeting. And I think it's a very bad idea also when it comes to the fact of democracy. Normally, the British government should be able to determine how much money they want to spend. I mean, that's why we have democracy so that they can say, well, if we get elected, our government will pay for this and that and this. And then they could decide in their budget that they will make those payments. But now, with a new idea, this kind of national monetary authority will be probably setting a limit on government spending. And that's, of course, it's, it goes completely against the grain of democracy. I mean, I mean, what's that? I mean, why should a group of unelected people tell the government how much money to spend? I mean, maybe the government wants to spend more, maybe they want to spend less. So it's completely unclear to me how monetary and fiscal policy would work under this kind of arrangement. I would be pretty sure that these kind of reforms would be taken back inside a very short amount of time, probably talking about days when it comes to monetary policy and maybe talking about quarters when it comes to fiscal policy, because these are both not very good ideas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you thought the Liz Trust thing created a bit of a kerfuffle, I think this would create an even bigger one, yeah. 
I mean, they have a section in here which talks about the NMA, the National Monetary Authority, as they call it, will manage the stock of national currency so that it's sufficient to support full employment. But how do you make that calculation? How do you say, we need this much and no more than that? And that will give us full employment, unless your definition of full employment was akin more of what we have at the moment, which is not really full employment. And you just say whatever unemployment is left is either a choice (laughs) or some result of some Nairu thing. Yeah, the way they do it at the moment, as you said, Patricia Nairu, non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. What that basically means in plainer English is whatever the unemployment level is that doesn't cause inflation to rise is natural. (laughs) And that's our target. And we'll know when we've gone past it and unemployment's quote unquote too low because inflation will rise. (laughs) So, you know, that in real numbers equates to lots of people being unemployed, millions in the UK, and in fact, maybe even going into the tens of millions when you count underemployed and precariously employed people as well. So you set me up nicely, Patricia, to say the MMT solution to this idea of how do you spend the perfect amount of money to create jobs for all that want them is the MMT job guarantee. I'll link to our episodes about that because it takes a bit of understanding, but it is in simple terms, the government acting as a employer of last resort. Sorry, Uh, I shouldn't interrupt, but the principle behind this idea of employer of last resort is to have, in terms of inflation control, because it has many objectives, but in terms of controlling and managing inflation and unemployment is to have a floating deficit that adjusts to the employment needs of the economy. Yeah, it's dynamic, yeah. It's dynamic. And by definition, if we talk about government spending being money creation, what we're saying is that money creation should never be fixed. It should be left to fulfill the needs of the economy to maintain full employment. Having a fixed national stock of currency like the Green Party is proposing is completely opposite to the objective of maintaining full employment. Yeah, and it sounds like going back to the gold standard. Yeah, exactly. Where you have a fixed supply of currency. I mean, with this proposal, I mean, they probably mean well. I think that they just don't know really what they're doing here, and they haven't thought it through from an MMT perspective, but they assume that the government can have some kind of control over the economy that in practical terms has never been there. So even we don't trust as much in the power of government to be able to say that this kind of proposal could work, right? I mean, as MMT economists, we know that the government, they can have their forecasts and everything, but they will never get net injections of government spending right to have full employment exactly. And so that's why we argue in favor of the job guarantee. But this kind of program, I mean, the positive thing that you can take away from it is that they are discussing how to change the monetary system to have a better outcome. I mean, that's what I like. And that's why I would say, well, look, you have the right scent. Just you need to maybe redefine your proposal a little bit and you'll get there eventually. I agree with that. I agree it's driven by good intentions. But I mean, this isn't new, right? They've been working with people who support this kind of policy for quite a few years, if not decades. And I think there is a tendency to see commercial banks as inherently private institutions that serve only private needs and in terms of they care only about their own profits. And therefore, this idea that private banks should have any power in issuing currency that is meant to be public, it's wrong, right? In It appears that to be their view of it. But if you understand private banks as an extension of the state in the sense that they've been given permission by the state to issue this currency to fulfill a specific purpose, of course, they abuse that purpose and they take liberties and that increase their profits, but they are fulfilling a public purpose that should not be in private hands. And I think they could do more challenging that idea that, well, if banks are fulfilling a public purpose, then why are they fully in private hands? Why don't we have a public alternative to commercial banking, perhaps? Yeah, I want to echo both of what you're saying there, that this is motivated by good intentions in that there's obviously something dysfunctional about the way that the system works. But yeah, our view is, and I know that we've said private bank all the way through this, I prefer to say commercial banks, because like you say, they're not in terms of money creation, Patricia, I agree with you. And we did a whole episode with Dirk about this idea of how in more technical terms, it's 
called the endogenous money view, the idea that when banks make loans, they don't take depositors' money and lend it to somebody who needs to borrow it. They just create new bank credit and that's now an asset to you, the person who borrowed it, but it's not a net asset to you because you also owe the bank the exact same amount. (laughs) So your promise to pay them back offsets the credit they've given you when they've extended a loan. But like you say, Patricia, that power to create bank credit, the thing that our whole economy runs on, if you're a normal person and not a bank, (laughs) that's the type of money that we use. The commercial banks have been deputized to do that by the government. You can't just wake up one morning and decide, I'm a bank now and I'm going to create money and plug your laptop into the (laughs) central bank system and type (laughs) money into existence. You have to be authorized by the government to do that. So there does seem to be a bit of confusion about that on the Green Party's website. But like you say, something needs to change. And of the parties that we've got on offer over here in the UK, I would say these guys seem to recognize that it does need transforming systemically, (laughs) whereas the other parties are like not really questioning that. They're working with the system as it is and not really proposing any reform, any substantive reform. So hats off to them for that. And they've got lots of positive ideas, but this is not one of them. So just wanted to put that caveat in there that I'm sure they're the good guys, but yeah, this is not good. So turning to Europe, I'm reading that the right wing are using the cost of living crisis to stir up opposition to a green transition, saying it will be too costly, it will create unemployment. The liberal elite don't care about the workers that they're throwing under the bus. The centre right seem to be agreeing with the far right on this, or at least they know that, oh, this is a vote getter. And here again, we're seeing this idea that we can't afford to stop the end of the world. It's too expensive. (laughs) How can we address this? Well, I think it's a political problem rather than economic problem, of course. So we can always create the money. I mean, in the Eurozone, it's the Euro system, which is the monopoly supplier of money, which is the ECB plus the national central banks. And because there has been some discussion about this on Twitter, the national central banks do not clear with the ECB. So they don't have accounts with the ECB. The ECB can create as much money as they are allowed to create under the going rules. And the same is for the national central banks. So if the government spend and they want to spend more, that's perfectly fine within the rules of the Eurozone. The only thing that stands against it is the national debt breaks and the fiscal framework, but there's always escape clauses. So if you have the political will, and that is what the pandemic has shown us, the money is there. And the Greek public debt to GDP ratio was 210% in 2020, yet there was no problem at all with running such a high public debt, if you want to call it that. And now what we have in the Eurozone is apparently a situation where the conservatives, they are attacking the progressive parties and they don't want to have this kind of legislation, which is, I think, called the nature restoration law. It belongs to the European Green Deal. And it's really important. And the national governments, they use this argument and they say, look, we might not have the money to turn this law into reality. And that is why we are against it. And of course, that is something where once again, you are using the lack of money as the argument for not doing some kind of policy. At least in the European level, it's at least halfway true. So yes, if the stability and growth pact with the deficit limits of 3% of GDP to capita, public debt to GDP, or public deficit to GDP, if that is turned back on, yes, theoretically, these kind of governments might be punished if they spend too much on green investment. But if you go back to 2019, there were 10 countries which had excessive deficits, so more than 3%, and only Romania, just one country, was punished. So the status quo that we have when it comes to government fiscal deficits in Eurozone is that they're not punished. And that means that, once again, this is probably more a political kind of posturing exercise and not so much a thing which is real in the sense of you have here real constraints of government spending. I'm pretty sure that the European Commission cannot say no to a country that says, yeah, well, of course we have an excessive deficit, but because of this European legislation, which belongs to the European Green Deal, we had to increase government spending. So that's the cause of our deficit. I mean, if then the European Commission were to punish that country, that would be extremely odd, both politically and economically. So I don't think that this will happen. 
It's very easy, and the right have always been doing this, of weaponizing poverty and economic hardship in favor of things that are ultimately damaging for all of us. They do it with inflation. They frame the central bank objectives of making people unemployed as a benefit to workers because prices will be lower. And it doesn't make any sense, but it doesn't stop them from trying. And I think that we've been through such a long period of hardship for so many families and workers. And it's very difficult to sell the kind of green initiatives or the Green New Deal as something that is primarily focused on reducing consumption, if that means also reducing the consumption of people who already don't consume very much at all. And so I think it's very important that we use language that makes it very clear that actually the working classes would be beneficiaries of most of these policies. And those who should reduce consumption, if at all, should be people who are already enjoying far more luxury than reasonable for any human to enjoy. And that is not part of any basic need. And that is ultimately quite damaging to the rest of us. So I think that's why you and I, Christian, are a little bit critical of that kind of degrowth narrative not because of the substance behind it, because if once you look at it, you understand that what they mean is not so much that people should be unemployed and poor, it's much more complex than that. But for most people, it's triggering because they associate recessions and degrowth with unemployment and with hardship. So maybe different language might be better. To channel, though, my inner Dr. Stephen Hale, who we have on quite frequently, he was saying that amongst the young people he talks to, they don't have quite the reaction to degrowth as some of the critics of the term. And my criticism is if you introduce a new word into the lexicon, and the next thing you have to do after you've introduced it is explain what it is. <laughs> and it's like, why did you do that? There were other ways to say this. <laughs> Especially when your critics will be very quick to make the point that degrowth is going to be damaging for workers and everything. And then you have to spend half an hour explaining why it isn't. What do they say? A lie will get halfway around the world while the truth is still getting its trousers on. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I noticed a couple of weeks ago, world leaders, including Emmanuel Macron, held a summit to figure out how to change the global financial system to, in their words, address climate change, the biodiversity crisis and development challenges. And MMT co-founder Bill Mitchell wrote a post about it and said, the solution that's being proposed is to allow financial markets to create debt and speculative derivative products to fund the overhaul of the system because apparently governments can run out of money. Governments may not or do not have the financial capacity for the transformation. I think I know what we think about this. Well, yes, I think we were discussing it the <laughs> other day as well. Basically, all these solutions from the political centre and the political right seem to be regarding climate change. For those who don't ignore it, the solution seems to be we need to work out how to make the solution profitable to the private sector. And so they all go around of we need new finance instruments in order for private companies to find this profitable. And they are avoiding the obvious solution, which is that it's never going to be profitable. There are some things in the economy that are not profitable. Social care for the elderly is one of them. Healthcare in general, <laughs> when done right, is one of them. And then climate as well is another one, I think. So they should stop trying to figure out how to make this profitable for the private sector players and start thinking about what direct action can the government take on this. Or at best recognise this crowding in idea that, okay, well, if you do want this to happen, then again, the governments need to step up and start the ball rolling for the crowding in to happen. The government needs to be the prime mover not the financial markets, not a new cryptocurrency or something. Yeah, especially when it comes to providing us with public goods. I mean, if you think that transport is a right and that a decent wage is a right and employment is a right and so on, I mean, that means the government will get to spend a lot of money to reform the infrastructure that we have. But I mean, they're using private products or products produced by the private sector to do it. So the obvious solution, as you said, is completely correct. Just spend it a bit more money or well, not a little bit by now, like significantly more spending from the government. And then the private sector will do whatever they can to sell stuff to the government that the government wants. And we can have 
a higher supply of renewable energy, for example, or we can have more trains and more train connections, for example. We can have more subway lines and more buses, metro buses. For all of this, we need the private sector to produce these kind of things. And fine, it's really not a question. I mean, just spend more government money. There's nothing you will, we will have to adjust to. And also in terms of financing, I mean, the firms know perfectly well how to borrow money if they can have more profit. So it's also a little bit of an excuse to say we need new kind of financial arrangements to get profits up. I mean, selling to the government <laughs> normally is always profitable for the private sector because otherwise they wouldn't do it. So I think this whole idea of green finance is just playing for time. It's just a waste of time in order not to address the practical questions that we are facing today, which can be addressed without talking about green finance at all. And that's what I find a little bit sad that this kind of green finance topic is not going away. But basically everything that they talk about is completely unusable for practical solutions because they have the wrong assumptions to begin with. And so we've outlined the poly crisis and we've got the MMT conference coming up, which is all about navigating the poly crisis. But also, Dirk, we shouldn't miss this opportunity to highlight the fact that you're teaching at Modern Money Lab at Torrens University. And that was organized by Stephen Hale and a fantastic team. And those courses are available globally. Tell us about what you've got going on there. Currently, I'm preparing a course which is called Equity, Equality and Employment. So we will discuss at length what kind of concepts we have, what is really equity, what does it mean when we talk about equality, and then when we measure things like employment, but also inequality or poverty, what kind of measures do we have, what kind of data do we have, what are the limitations of these approaches. Just for example, today I read a tweet by the American Economic Review, which is a mainstream journal, maybe the most important one or famous one. And there's a paper there by Gabriel Sackman and others, course of Thomas Piketty, and they found data for very high incomes. So they said, okay, so inequality is much, much higher than we used to think, because now that we have data for the top 0.01%, the picture has changed quite drastically. So the course will go into detail to make sure that we can talk about reality, that we can talk about the theories that are behind these kind of different indicators that we are using. For example, Thomas Piketty has popularized a lot of indicators like the 90 to 10 ratio of income distribution, for example. And then also we talk in the end about employment and how inequality is also connected to employment or lack of employment. And we end the course with basically policy proposals to address the poly crisis that we see also in these kind of fields. So I'm very much looking forward to this and it's always fun to prepare something new from scratch. So I've taught about employment before, I taught about equality before, and also about equity, but never in one course. So I'm really excited to see this happening. So before we wrap up, uh, of course, we need to understand the challenges facing us, the poly crisis, as we've been talking about. But Dirk, for anyone feeling overwhelmed by the scale of it, what gives you hope? Well, I just read in a newspaper article that when it comes to the European Union's natural restoration law, there was a letter written by the trainees in the European Parliament and it is an internal letter saying, please do sign this into law. <laughs> so the letter reads, it is distressing to say the least to see people who are responsible for our future care so little about it. And it goes on, we know that many of you are making political decisions. As a, nevertheless, the time for considering climate change a political issue has run out. Scientists are banging out at our doors, reminding us about the urgency of the climate crisis. And yet you are choosing to vote against regulations which may provide our generation and planet Earth with at least a chance for a brighter future. The letter continues, it says here. So I think that the young people, they have understood the challenges that we are facing. They see all these trends and all the trends are moving into kind of bad territory when it comes to inequality or when it comes to the climate crisis. They see that because they're younger, they know that things have to turn around because otherwise life will be very bleak for them. So it gives me hope to see that apparently these trainees, whatever their political views are, that they were able to create a letter and sign a letter to support these decisions and to alert politicians about the urgency of all of this. Also, a couple of weeks ago, I was in New York City and I flew on to Georgia, but I spent one night in New York City and it was when the clouds came from the forest fires in Canada. And it was completely dismal. It was like a dystopia 
the city smelled bad and visibility was maybe 100 meters, 200 meters. And I think people have realized that climate change is real and it will affect them. I mean, this is how we are. We are human beings. And what we see with our own eyes is for us, that's reality. And even though it's very bad that this has to happen before we maybe change our minds, but climate change is coming home and it's not nice. And I think more and more people will wake up like these trainees do because they will say, well, this will affect our lives and our future and our children's lives. And I think the people who, who realize this, the share of people, will go up in the future. So this is why I'm positive about the future. I think we will have to solve these problems. And as John Maynard Keynes once said, roughly, is of course, there's interests and they can stop things from happening. But in the end, ideas will win. And I'm still pretty positive that this is also the happy end, more or less, that we will see in terms of policy making, at least whether it's fast enough and quickly enough to avoid catastrophic change, of course, is a natural science question. It's one that we can answer right now. Great stuff. That's a great place to leave it. We've been speaking to Dr. Dirk Entz, and I'll link to where you can stay current with Dirk in the show notes for this episode and to where you can find out more about the third international European MMT conference, which takes place in Berlin on the 9th and 10th of September. And that will feature Dirk, along with Warren Mosler, L. Randall Ray, Nathan Tankus, Stephen Hale, and Dongo Sambasilla, Yan Lang, who was our fabulous guest last week. So check that out if you haven't already. And many more. For our UK listeners, there's going to be an event in London on the 1st of September featuring MMT founder Warren Mosler. Tickets aren't on sale yet, and so I'll link to where you can sign up to the GIMS mailing list for updates about that. And finally, for our Patreon subscribers, there's a link to all our patron-only episodes, including one with Dr. Sam Levy about economics in the movies and edited audio highlights of the book launch of the 2023 anthology MMT key insights, leading thinkers. Check out the show notes for all of the above. But for now, thanks so much for joining us once again today on the MMT podcast, Dr. Dirk Enns. It was a pleasure. Thank you. That was the MMT podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month, and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. You can also find me on Twitter at mmtpodcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino, and you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you. 